Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to welcome Richard Brown and Louise Wright from MPL, who are our speakers today. Um, and we're going to start with Richard's talk on SI prefixes first. Um, he's going to talk for about 35 minutes and then there'll be about 10 minutes for questions following that. So I want to hand over to Richard. OK, thank you very much, uh, Jane. So if we're all ready to start, I, I will begin. Um, so this talk is called A Short History of the Prefixes, and we'll talk a little bit about what prefixes are, the SI prefixes, and uh, a, a change that's happened recently uh, to the SI prefixes. So I'm Richard Brown. I'm the head of metrology at the National Physical Laboratory, metrology being the science of measurement. And there I have the responsibility for maintaining the accuracy of the UK's measurement standards and ensuring their comparability internationally. Uh, and also I have this remit via committees I'm on to look after the international system of units more widely um, and improve it where appropriate. And we'll, we'll hear a little bit about this um, as the talk goes on. So the first thing I ought to introduce then is the international system of units itself, the SI. Now, the SI is the only globally agreed system of units, and you will be aware that it's used around the world as the basic language for science, technology, uh, industry and uh, trade. And whilst it was formalised in its current form in 1960, it originated from the Meat Convention Agreement in 1875. And when we think about the international system of units, we often think about the base units, metre, second, mole and so on that are familiar to us. We also think about the derived units, so metres per second, newtons, watts and so on. And since the revision to the SI in 2019, we may also think of the defining constants on which the base units um, are, are defined nowadays. What we generally don't think about when we think about the SI are the SI prefixes. And actually, this is a surprise because they are a fundamental part of the SI um, and arguably the part of the SI best known to the general public because of the presence of these prefixes in common weights and measures such as kilogram, millimeter, milliliter, kilowatt hour for energy, of course, and because the prefixes have entered our common vocabulary for technical terms, such as nanotechnology, micro scooter, gigafactory, and so on. What are these SI prefixes then? I'm, I'm going to talk here about the list that was in existence up to the 17th of, of November last year. I don't want to spoil the surprise that's coming next. So the, the SI prefixes are names and symbols for decibel multiples and decimal submultiples that are used together with SI units. And you will notice that we really have um, two types of SI prefixes, if, if you like. The, the first set, which go up in steps of 10, or 10 to the power one, if you like, so giving us multiplying factors of 10, 100, 1000. And then we have the second set of SI prefixes after that, which go up in steps of 10 to the three or steps of a thousand. And we will talk <clears throat> in a little bit about why we have those different steps and why those prefixes um, at the lower level for steps of 10 are so useful. That's what SI prefixes are then. What are SI prefixes not? Well, something we should clear up now, SI prefixes are not names for big numbers. We will see that SI prefixes represent multipliers to be used together with units, but are not themselves names for numbers. So if we want names for numbers, we can go to Wikipedia and we can look up um, both the short and the long scale, which comes up with names of a million, a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion, and so on. And you will notice from uh, this article that the, these names for big numbers indeed are not universally standardised and, and global usage varies considerably. In the English speaking world, we tend now to use the short scale, um, but in much of the rest of the world, they use the long scale. 
And in Asia, there are completely different ways of counting. So uh, SI prefixes are not names for big numbers. If you're interested in big numbers, there's a good number file video on YouTube at the bottom there that uh, gives some information on these different numbering conventions. SI prefixes are also not related to the mathematics of really huge numbers. So SI prefixes represent multipliers that we use in practical measurement. Um, so we're thinking here of numbers up to about 10 to the 30, as we will see. Um, now, a Google, for instance, in, in number theory is 10 to the power 100. So that's that's 10 to the power 70 larger than any prefix multiplier we'll be considering. And it, it's also 10 to the power 20 larger than the number of particles in the universe. So these magnitudes of uh, that we, we come across, these huge numbers are inconceivably larger than anything we would um, come across in practical measurement. So SI prefix is, again, not related to these huge numbers that we find in, in abstract number theory. Again, there's some very good um, videos on, on big numbers in YouTube uh, if you're interested. How do we use prefixes then? Well, we, we take our list of prefixes that you will see on the left, and we take our list of SI base or derived units that you will see on the right, and we put those together to form a new unit. And as we will see later, that, that's quite important. And we do that and we can come up with a variety of examples. So petajoules, gigaohms, kilometers, decimeter cube, milligrams, microvolts, nanoseconds, atomoles per mole, yocta watts per square meter per hertz. We can, almost infinite is the, is the number of combinations we can come up with. And what's important here is that the, the SI brochure, which is the authoritative document on how the international system of unit work, units works, tells us very clearly that the complete set of SI units includes both the coherent set and the multiples and submultiples formed using the SI prefixes. So you can see from the diagram on the bottom right, then the, the SI units in its totality, they're the base units, they're the derived units, um, they're also the SI unit multiples and the SI unit submultiples. Now, what do we mean by coherent units? Well, uh, coherent units mean that the equations between numerical values of quantities take exactly the same form as the equations between the quantities themselves. And that's quite important because we will see later that using prefixes changes the size of the unit rather. So the base <laughs> units and derived units are coherent. The ones using multiples and submultiples of prefixes um, are not. And when we form uh, new units using the prefixes, as you will see, um, the uh, prefix symbol attaches to the unit symbol and forms an inseparable unit. And that's important. So for that example there, centimeters cubed, um, it's the whole of the centimetre that's cubed, not the metre, and then we add on uh, the centi. And this shows us, as we previously discussed, how important um, the prefixes hecto, deca, deci and centi are, because they give us finer spacing for area and volume measurements. If we didn't have though, that spacing, uh, the gap between one cubic metre and one uh, cubic millimetre would be 10 to the power nine. But using a decimeter, we can reduce that gap just to a, a thousand. So very important for volume and area measurements. And it's also important, uh, also the reason why the non-SI units, litre and hectare, remain particularly useful for expressing area and volume. So what, what are the advantages of the SI prefixes? Well, we have a decimal measurement system and it works seamlessly across the measurement scale. The SI prefixes allow us to do that because as our measurements get bigger and smaller, we use the same unit, but we simply add on uh, prefixes. And this allows us to aim for a numerical value of our measurement between one and 100, meaning these are on the human scale, they're easier to relate to, conceptualize and, and communicate. And, this this ability to do that should avoid the intro, the introduction of non SI units. And you can see from the example at the bottom here how easy it is to move from a kilometer to a meter to a millimeter. Whereas, for instance, the imperial system, as the size of the measurement changes, um, new unit names um, are invented. 
And just to reiterate this point, here is uh, a length scale over 18 orders of magnitude. And the SI prefixes here allow for the use of SI units across this range of quantity sizes, which really is fundamental for the effective communication of measurement results across disciplines. So despite the fact we have these 18 orders of magnitude, we can move seamlessly from nanometer, micrometer, millimeter, meter, uh, and so on. The use of SI prefixes also helps us with human scale numerical value. So using the prefixes ensures that the numerical value of the quantity we're expressing remains on this human scale. So ideally between one and 100, and this makes our results easier to comprehend and, and communicate. So I've given an example here of a, uh, the amount fraction of sulfur hexafluoride in the atmosphere, very important greenhouse gas. And we've got three ways of expressing this. The first is via decimal notation. So you can see there. The second is scientific notation. And the third is, is SI prefix notation. And I hope you'll agree with me that the decimal notation there is quite difficult to comprehend. We have a lot of zeros to contend with after that decimal point. The scientific notation is, is somewhat easier. Um, it, we've given it the appearance of a human scale, but we've still got that 10 to the power minus 11 to cope with. But the SI prefix notation is by far the easiest. It's a very elegant 11 picomoles per mole. Now, what's changed there? Well, you can see that we've changed the unit size. We're now using picomoles per mole, not moles per mole. And as a consequence, the uh, numerical value we express has changed as well. It's, it's now become simply 11. And so this prefix notation makes things very easy to uh, comprehend. That's then an introduction to what SI prefixes are. I want to spend the rest of the talk uh, describing the history of these prefixes and how they uh, came to be. So prior to uh, the origins of the metric system in 1795, there was really no concept of prefixes. We simply used different unit names as measurements got bigger. But it was after the French Revolution when the first metric system was put in place that the first prefixes were, were used. And I've put that inverted commas because they weren't really identified separately as, as prefixes. Yeah. They were used together uh, with units. And so we had prefixes then covering the range 10 to the power minus three to 10 to the power four. 10 to the power four was then known as Myria. And they were in use as were prefixes like double and demi for, for twice and, and half. There were also special names for area uh, and volume, some of which, of course, we still use uh, now. Now, we have to spool on um, 85 years or so uh, and four years after the signing of the Meter Convention, the International Committee on Weights and Measures, the CIPM, first uh, adopted prefixes in the metric system. Um, and this original metric system influenced the initial list of, of symbols that they adopted. And in this initial list, they were presented in context with their usage together with units. So prefixes were not separate entities, but existed only as these defined units. And, and because a list was provided, there were things missing. You will see from this first list from the CIPM in 1879, that milliliter was missing from uh, these measures of capacity that were given. And if you look in the bottom left as well, there's a very troublesome symbol micron, which is just presented on its own to mean 10 to the minus six meters, but without any association uh, with the unit meter. And, and that will come into play as we move forward in the story. So we move on a bit further now, just after the turn of, of the century. In 1901, milliliter was added uh, to that list. And there was also a, um, a lambda sign added to mean microliter in the same way we have that micro symbol for uh, micrometer. Another four years later, and the CIPM officially added that prefix Myria for 10 to the power four and other unit expressions to fill the gaps in their original list of uh, units. But as we will see, there was still this ongoing confusion between what was a unit, what was a prefix, 
and what was a special name uh, for a unit multiplier. But nonetheless, it implicitly meant that in 1905, uh, prefixes from between 10 to the power 4 and 10 to the power 3 were now in use. And we know this because in 1966, Jan de Boer, who was then the president of the committee that looked after units for the meter convention, uh, wrote a nice history of how um, this topic developed. And you can see from the CIPM's list of units in 1905, we now have um, milliliter there uh, and some other unit terms, but we also still have that troublesome micro symbol um, in the bottom left. Another 30 years passed and a proposal was made to treat that micro symbol as meaning 10 to the power minus six, um, meaning that all of a sudden we had this idea of a micrometer being 10 to the power minus six meters. And this proposal not only re rendered that symbol micro um, redundant on its own for meaning micrometer, but it also rendered this uh, lambda sign for microliter and uh, the gamma sign for microgram redundant as well. Now, at the same time, um, electrical engineering was beginning to use mega to mean 10 to the power six for mega ohms and megawatts. And actually since 1874, uh, a rival unit system, the CGS system had used micro and mega um, as prefixes. So in 1935, the uh, CIPM decided to drop the prefix Miria because the capital M symbol would have caused confusion and adopted instead the familiar prefixes mega for 10 to the power six and micro for 10 to the power uh, minus six. Then we enter this 25 year period where we have prefixes between 10 to the six and 10 to the minus six, but people often wanted to express quantities that were larger than that. And we see during that period of time the use of, of double prefixes um, in the past uh, when relevant prefixes weren't available. And an example of this that we're probably all aware of is micro microfarads. Now we would call that uh, picofarads. And there was also some <clears throat> local usage, decimilli for 10 to the minus four contracted to dimmi was used in, in France until 1961. But as we will see, these, these, this use of double prefixes was formally prohibited in 1960 when the SI was formalized. But you still see some ripples uh, still on from that because um, I found here some information about uh, wavelength bands for use in telecommunications. This is a an IEC standard from their Electropedia pages, and they still use these metric qualifiers, which are sort of double metric qualifiers, like hectomegametric, decamegametric. So they refer to them here as not being names of units, but metric qualifiers instead. So there is some hangover from, from those days when double prefixes were used. Anyway, we, we move on to 1960 and the formalization of the SI and the SI prefixes and the very famous resolution 12 of the 11th CGPM in 1960. This formalized the SI prefixes. It also added some new prefixes, Terra, Giga, Nano and Pico. And these were already in use by ISO, the International Standardization Organization and IUPAC, uh, IUPAP, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, possibly as early as 1940. So another example here of the Meter Convention using prefixes that were in use elsewhere. And this gave us then a list of prefixes in 1960 between 10 to the 12 and 10 to the minus 12. It wasn't long after that, then only another four years, that um, some further prefixes were adopted for submultiples down to 10 to the minus 18. And again, these were terms uh, adopted that were in previous use by IUPAP in 1960, and they were generally for describing dimensions occurring in nuclear physics and also to measure with increasing precision the time intervals relevant to stable atomic phenomena. We then move on uh, 11 years more and we have a symmetrical extension in the multiple direction with PETA and EXA. And the drivers there were to describe the frequency range of electromagnetic radiation then being measured, 
world energy usage and radioactivity when expressed in becquerels. And indeed, this was an 11 year period, as you can see, between 1964 and 1975, where we had an asymmetrical prefix range. And that hasn't been repeated since. And it only happened once before between 1905 and 1935, when we had that range of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the minus 3. So you might ask then, how did these prefixes gain their names? And, and again, we're um, grateful to Jan de Boer here for in 1974 highlighting at that time where the prefixes had um, got their names from. So the initial ones up to a thousand uh, that were used in the original metric system, well, they were really just based on the Greek and Latin for those numbers themselves, 10, 100 and a thousand. Then we move into a period where the meter convention used prefixes that were already in use in other organizations. And these ones were, these names were based rather unsystematically on sizes. So for instance, the Greek for small or dwarf or the Italian for very small, the, the Greek for giant and monstrous and so on. Uh, and that framed that period of naming. And then the final period of naming, again, moved back to um, names for either powers of 10, in the case of femto and atto, the Danish for 15 and 18, or powers of 1,000. So we start to see the meter convention taking control of these prefix names when they suggest um, peta and exa, which relate to um, powers of 1,000. So uh, the power to which 1,000 is raised to generate 10 to the power 15 and 10 to the power 18. So the, the meter convention is starting to take control um, of the naming at that point. But it didn't fully take control um, until 1991 when it addressed the emerging needs of chemistry. So in 1971, the mole had been adopted as an SI based unit, and there was a need for chemists to express molecular quantities in SI units whose magnitude was actually more suited to, to molar quantities. And this meant that we had to have new prefixes related to the size of the Avogadro constant, um, six times 10 to the 23. So the 19th CGPM in 1991 adopted the prefixes that you see there, uh, up to Yotta for 10 to the 24 and Yocto for 10 to the minus 24. And on the right hand side, you can see there the note in the ninth edition of the SI brochure, which talks about these names originating from um, septo, as an example there for the seventh power of 10 to the power three, but we use the letter Z in place of the letter S to avoid um, using the letter S as a symbol. Um, and again, similarly for Yocto and Yotta, they come from Octo, suggesting the eighth power of a thousand, but the letter Y is added to avoid the letter O being used as a symbol because of the confusion with the number zero. And this uh, way of naming things will become relevant for the most recent change. That therefore is how those SI prefixes have changed over time. We had our initial set of SI prefixes adopted, 1879. We've seen that the Miria was added we responded to the needs of electrical science and engineering. Um, the SI was formalized in 1960 uh, and soon after responded to requirements for nuclear physics, precision time, uh, electromagnetism, energy, radioactivity. And in 1991, uh, responded to the requirements of chemistry to express SI units um, for molecular quantities. And then we entered this uh, 31 year period, the longest period that the um, meter convention had gone without expanding the range of SI prefixes. And we move forward then to 2022, when the SI had to consider and respond to the needs of data science, digitalization and big science in general. And in particular, the SI needed to respond to rapid increases in the size of data sets, used in science and technology, and also the detail with which we can uh, study the universe. And the final part of this talk will concentrate on that final section, uh, the recent update to the SI prefixes 
and perhaps the future or the far future of the SI prefixes. So why then do we need new prefixes at any time? Well, there are three main drivers. The, the first is to do with progress in science, requiring an expanded range of magnitudes of coverage. Um, the second is increasing the usage in communities where the prefix range is not currently fit for purpose. And the third is about ensuring that unofficial names do not become uh, adopted de facto. And the, uh, the middle driver there is always present. We always want to engage communities with using prefixes more widely. But the two drivers on the left and right there, they were particularly present in information technology and data science. We will see why in a moment. But in all these cases, the SI must respond. Otherwise, non-SI solutions will be created. Well, what are the requirements of data science and, and digital storage, Dan? Well, we see nowadays that the annual size of the global data sphere, that's the quantity of data stored in the world, is increasing. It's increasing exponentially, and we expect that acceleration only to get uh, faster because of digitalization, perhaps the advent of quantum computing, the Internet of Things, 6G communications, and, and so on. And by 2025, we expect that global data sphere to be around 175 zettabytes, and very soon after that, it will be at the yottabyte level. And of course, the yottabyte level would have been the top of the previous scale. And so the question becomes then, what is larger than a yottabyte? And my uh, journey on this uh, prefix route began about uh, five and a half years ago when I first heard this BBC more or less radio programme um, about the fact that we were running out of prefixes to describe the quantity of data in the world and that there were these unofficial prefixes, <coughs> Brontobyte from Brontosaurus and Hellabyte from Hell of a Big Number that were circulating unofficially and had some traction, some danger of being uh, adopted. Now, I realized at the time that these were both unsuitable because they began with letters B and H. And so the symbols for the prefixes from Brontobite and Hellabite would not be suitable because those letters are already in use either for prefixes or other commonly used units. But these suggestions are actually quite widespread. And, and here's a recent uh, blog post from the UK Health Security Agency, again, referring to Brontobyte as 10 to the power 27 bytes. Here's Google's unit converter. Uh, I've asked it to convert uh, 1,000 yottabytes, and it's given me the answer in helibytes. So these, are, these proposals were starting to gain some traction. So there's a clear need from the community for an expanded range of prefixes. There's obviously a danger of unofficial names being adopted. We can, we can see that. So official SI prefixes had to be provided instead. And, and why is the SI particularly interested in, in data science? Well, one of the reasons is that SI decimal prefixes are preferred in data science much more than the binary prefixes, which are standardized in the IEC 80,000 part 13 document. And when you look at the prevalence of these prefixes in scientific literature, it's fairly clear that decimal uh, that uh, decimal prefixes are used perhaps two orders of magnitude more frequently than, than binary prefixes. So decimal prefixes are preferred in data science, certainly nowadays. They're also preferred in everyday life. So all the storage media that we use, be it iPhones, flash drives, hard drives, they're all labeled in terms of um, decimal prefix storage. And this is important because in the past, there has been some, some confusion between decimal and, and binary prefixes. And in, in the very old days, and uh, in the early days of computers, when they had only kilobytes of RAM, the confusion between a, a kilobyte and a kibibyte was not particularly extreme. It only resulted in a, in a couple of percent difference. But as the storage sizes get larger, we see that the difference between a, 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 a tebibyte, for instance, and a terabyte can be up to 10%. So one has to be very clear when labeling the size of these data storage 
um, devices, what one's referring to. And it's quite clear now from a number of court cases that when we say a gigabyte, we mean uh, a one times 10 to the, the nine bytes. That's quite clear now that decimal prefixes are used. That's the requirement then for the, um, the large range, the multiple range of the prefixes. Why might we want to have a symmetrical extension to the sub-multiple range? Well, there are many technical areas such as particle physics, astronomy, and so on that would benefit from an extension to the sub-multiple range. The Jansky, named after this chap on the right, is a non-SI unit of spectral flux density used in radio astronomy that would benefit current state-of-the-art radio astronomy target sources um, at 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meters per hertz, right in the sweet spot of these new prefixes. So there's, there's requirements there as well. If we're going to have some new prefixes, what are the options? Well, we can use the familiar solution using more single letter prefixes. As we will see, not very many letters remain. We could reintroduce double prefixes, as was done prior to 1960, but we would need strict rules um, to do that. Or we could come up with some completely new nomenclature, um, but if that's unfamiliar and, and of course risks non-adoption and confusion, but does overcome the constraints uh, of running out of letters in the alphabet. But actually, we didn't need to look any further than that top solution. Uh, we do have, when we examine the English alphabet, which is used for these symbols, we do find that Q and R are pretty much unused now for units that are in general use. So Q and R could be used uh, for our new prefixes. How did we then come up with the names? Well, Q and R give us the symbols uh, that we use. Um, we also know that for the symbols, we have capital letters for multiples, lowercase for submultiples. In terms of creating the names, the multiples always end in an A. In recent times, the submultiples end in an O. And for the stem of the name, it, these are very loosely based, as you will have seen from the last time the prefixes were expanded in their range. They're very loosely based on the Greek for nine and the Greek and Latin for ten. Um, that being the power to which a thousand is raised to give us 10 to the 27 and, and 10 to the 30. And that gives us then um, RONA, capital R, for 10 to the power 27, RONTO, lowercase r, for 10 to the power minus 27, QUETA, capital Q, for 10 to the power 30, and QUECTO, lowercase q, for 10 to the power minus 30. Now, those of you who are classical scholars, uh, might realise that actually the Greek and Latin for 10 suggest more quecker with a double C than they do quetta with a double T. But quecker turned out during the consultation phase to be an unacceptable suggestion because it's very, very close to a swear word in, in Portuguese language. So that was best to avoid. So we went forward with those, the proposals that you see on the screen that formed resolution, uh, draft resolution C of the General Conference on Weights and Measures last November. When a resolution is approved, it gets a, a number instead of a letter. So it became resolution three. It was approved on the 18th of November, just after quarter past 11 uh, UTC. And we all of a sudden we have 20 percent more SI units to use because of a 20 percent increase in our range of prefixes. And you may have seen a little bit about this story already. It's gained a lot of media publicity. People are very keen on these new names uh, for big numbers. And so we have, therefore, our 24 prefixes now covering 60 orders of magnitude. Here are the new ones at the top, Queta, Rona, Quecto and Ronto that have just been approved. This is a really useful, timely and low risk addition to our SI. It's clearly essential for areas which have a pressing need, as we've shown, like data science. But it remains optional, but very useful for wider use in other areas. And the main thing is that SI prefixes in general promote effective and unified communication in science. And so if you're any, in any doubt about what uh, a one with 30 zeros after it looks like, or a 30 zeros followed by one looks like here are the numbers 10 to the 30 and 10 to the power minus 30 written out in that decimal form. And 
when we've been interacting with the general public over these um, new prefixes, it turns out that data science is actually, uh, so quantities of data are quite difficult to visualize, but actually we can use these prefixes for things that might be more familiar to people. So we can talk about the mass of Jupiter being approximately two quetograms, the mass of the Earth being approximately six ronograms, mass of an electron being approximately one ronsogram, and so on and so forth. So we have some really good examples here that help engage uh, the public with the size of um, what these prefixes are. So finally, I've just got a couple of slides on, on what's next for these prefixes. So one immediate next step, we've talked already about binary prefixes being used for uh, data storage. Well, now we've got these new decimal prefixes. We should update the IEC documents to provide some more binary prefixes, and these should be analogous and complementary <laughs> To the range of prefixes available so far and we know following um, previous convention these would be Robbie for 10 to the power 90 symbol ri and quebby uh, for 2 to the power uh, 100 and then the final slide uh, from me is just to speculate on the far future of the si prefixes and and perhaps the requirement for double prefixes so We've seen from the media interest uh, currently that there's always interest in new names for prefixes. And you can look in the literature and you can find that people have published names for prefixes up to 10 to the power 100 or, or so on. But actually, there's no traction for these new names and new symbols unless there's a requirement. And I would expect that that's probably not a consideration for at least 25 years uh, or so. But if we did need uh, a further extension to the range of prefixes, undoubtedly we would need to use double or compound prefixes again. And if we were going to use this, uh, they would need simple rules. Um, for example, use only either queta or quecto as the second prefix for multiples or submultiples, uh, respectively. And that would give us killer queta, mega queta, milli quecto, and micro quecto. Um, and in one swoop, we would uh, provide an extension from 10 to the power 60 to 10 to the power minus 60. So I think that's the far future of, of SI prefixes. I don't think we need to worry about that for um, a good 25 or 30 years or so. So I will just leave you then uh, with the new prefixes and say, yeah, thank you very much for your attention and for listening. So what I'm going to talk about, um, Richard mentioned that one of the drivers behind this change is the growth of um, the size of data sets. And what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the digital NMI um, and what MPL in particular is doing around these large scale data sets and trying to make sure that good measurement science, good metrology is carried through um, all of the data sets that we're using. Now, I want to start with an anecdote. Um, so I used to work for a firm that made roof tiles back in 1996. And one of the things that we used to do was to go into factories and to um, effectively log the temperature that the roof tiles were seeing during production and in particular during drying. And we were using those loggers that you can see on the screen there. And these are clearly digital. You can see that they're digital. They were small enough to fit into um, a film canister, for those of you that remember analog film, and they would capture data for sufficient time that we were able to analyse what was happening to these tiles whilst they were drying. Now, the point of this is that digitalisation is not a new thing. Um, it's been going for, well, clearly well north of um, 20 years. And I quite like this quote that says the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. What we're seeing with the rise of digitalization is the future effectively becoming more evenly distributed. So in terms of what I mean by digitalization, it's quite a broad term. I mean the use of digital sensors, but also algorithms and computers, and particularly um, automation using computers, where we have machine actionable data and things like that. And I'll talk about some examples a little bit further. Um, as I say, this is becoming a lot more widespread, and there are lots of reasons listed there for that. Um, the ones that I want to highlight that have made a really big difference to my mind are um, Wi-Fi has got more reliable and faster. So in 1996, every time that we um, examined a clay tile 
drier. We were having to take 20 different sensors at the end of the day and plug them into a computer through a fiddly little wire, download the data, save it all. Real pain in the neck. If we were doing it these days, we'd be able to stream the data considerably more directly. And that's made a huge difference to the amount of data that people are prepared to gather and are able to analyse. And the other one I want to highlight is that now that everybody has a phone or a laptop or a tablet, they're able to interact with digital data much more easily. So um, there's more desire to have digital data delivered to people rather than having a report that you refer to when you need to. Um, now, in terms of what it enables then, I mentioned automation before, and this could go from the simple data gathering whereby you're making sure that you're um, collecting things automatically and the background information as well, right the way up to um, automatic parameter setting for a series of experiments where potentially you could gather the data, analyse the data, and then use the results of that analysis to decide what experiment you're going to do next automatically. Um, another big one is remote interaction. Again, for control, this has been happening for a very long time, but we're gradually moving to the point where remote calibration is becoming of more interest. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail further down. Advanced analytics, I'm going to do quite a deep dive into because I think that that's one where things are really changing very rapidly, particularly within metrology. And then finally, as I mentioned, digital delivery and data sharing in particular. Um, if we're going to solve problems like climate change, like microbial resistance to antimicrobials, then we need to be sharing data across domains. And if we're going to do that, then digital data is really the only way to do it. But we need to um, make sure that we're sharing the right kind of information. Now, in terms of benefits, then um, automation obviously saves time, reduces error rates, frees up skilled staff. So it doesn't replace staff, but it means that the boring, repetitive bits of their job, copy pasting from one file into another, can be removed and they get more time to actually think about the data that they're looking at. Um, and also there's the aspect of capturing richer information. Again, this comes back to um, sharing data and data reuse in particular. So it may be that because you're able to capture more data and store more data, um, you can capture the stuff that you know that you need now. But there may also be extra information that will come in handy in three years time, but you just don't know it yet. So it gives you that option of being able to have more and more data. Um, to look at future problems as well as the problems you're trying to solve now. In terms of large scale analytics, um, we're able to identify unexpected or unknown correlations. And again, this isn't to replace the human, it's to kind of steer research potentially. So if you have got a massive data set and I can identify correlations between some of the variables within that, then that tells me that there might be something interesting that's causing that. It's not that my work has been replaced by an algorithm, it's that my work is enhanced by the algorithm, helping me to figure out where there's potentially interesting science to be done. Um, you can streamline data gathering. So if it turns out there's only four variables that are actually of interest, then I can shrink down and just collect those and help me focus. And you can use it for predictive maintenance. This is one where having a very large data set means that rare events, um, you have enough rare events to be able to analyze them more thoroughly. So you're able to predict the warning signs of failure before they occur and hence go out and maintain the device that's producing those warning signs more effectively. And then finally, in terms of remote interaction and digital delivery, um, well, the obvious one is on-demand real-time information, but there's obvious, there's also the ability to share appropriate data throughout a supply chain um, in a machine actionable way rather than a human actionable way in some cases, but it's um, a great opportunity to be able to provide the kind of background information that you need for confidence in that data as well. Um, so this really relates to this next point, which is that it isn't just data that we need, it's the metadata. So metadata is about giving data context and meaning and really giving you the confidence that the data that you have in front of you is the data that you need. So this could include the device identification number, the calibration information, the temperature that the measurement was made at and so on and so forth. I'm sure that all of us have had a situation where we know that we've got a data file 
um, for a particular experiment that we did three years ago. And then we spend a long time trying to figure out which one it is because we don't have that metadata easily to hand. It's in a lab book or it's in a different file or we've just not kept the records. Um, now, this is something that's been given a lot of consideration in academic spheres in particular. And there's something that I'm sure many of you have come across called the FAIR principles that are about making data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And the way that you make data, those four positive things, is to associate the metadata with it because it's the metadata that provides the labels that make it findable. Um, it's the metadata that provides the background information to ensure interoperability and so on. And in order to make those work, we need to move towards standardisation. And this is partly why MPL is interested in this. Um, this means standardisation of vocabulary, or at least the ability to translate between different vocabularies used in different fields. It means standardisations of formats and of structures, not just for metadata, but potentially for data as well. Um, and digitalization actually helps with this, and particularly it helps with the adoption of the standards that will inevitably come because you're able to automate a lot of the capture of the metadata. Um, if you look at a typical measuring instrument header file, there's an awful lot of information in there that's basically the metadata that you need. So all you need is some algorithm that's going to rip the relevant bits out for a given um, for a given instrument type and things like that. And if you're capturing information from humans, um, if you're using a digital interface, you can use drop down menus that mean that the vocabulary is going to be restricted. So it means that, again, we can capture the information that we need quickly and simply in a machine usable format. Um, really, when we're talking about the FAIR principles, we're not talking about people being able to find data. We're talking about algorithms being able to find data. So all of this needs to be in a format that machines can understand, which is another reason why we have to move towards standardization, um, because obviously most algorithms can't really handle ambiguity. In terms of what's going on uh, within the global metrology community, then the the answer is an awful lot at the moment. There's recently been um, a letter of agreement that's not described on that slide, acknowledging that a digital framework for the SI is going to become more and more important to the global quality infrastructure and that um, everybody needs to work together on putting one together. Um, there's a CIPM task group and experts group at the moment that's going to evolve into a broader community over the coming areas that's going to look at how you go about developing that framework and some work's being done already. And a lot of the regional metrology organisations also have working groups. So in particular, Euromet, the European metrology, uh, regional metrology organisation, has a working group on metrology for digitalisation and has recently funded a couple of projects release, related to digitalisation as well. Um, but a lot of these efforts are really focusing on the data model for the SI, the metadata structure and so on, because these are the aspects where we need harmonization and standardization to ensure that when we're set, when we're sharing metrology data internationally, um, we're able to do so in a machine actionable and kind of future proofed way as well. So in terms of um, what kind of structures you get when we look at digital metrology data then. We start off with a set of sensors that may potentially have computational power um, and are measuring lots of different things related to the system that we're interested in. And then those are potentially streaming into a local hub that again may have computational power and that could be uploading to the cloud and the cloud could be sending it to a high performance computer. The high performance computer could then be communicating with a laptop with a computer in an office or it could be pushing results out to a phone and you can see that there's lots of different possibilities for where the computation is taking place. I also want to stress that the arrows indicate transfer of metadata as well as the data so really that background information has to travel with the data all of the time in order for it to be um, maximally useful. And all of those arrows could potentially be double ended. So it could be that as I'm receiving the data stream on my phone that tells me about um, the temperature measurements that are being captured, it may be that I can see that the temperature is changing more rapidly than I'd expected. So I might want to double the capture rate. So I might be sending information back as well. And all of this um, 
needs to be considered when we're thinking about how we're going to use that data and make sure we can have confidence in it. So I've mentioned automation fairly extensively already. Um, the thing I want to stress here is when I've talked to scientists about the potential for automating some of the processes that they're doing, they get concerned that that automation may mean a, a loss of understanding. So they think back to the days when they first started out in science and a lot of the understanding that they gained about what they're doing was um, created when they were thinking about the data that they were moving from one place to another and how to analyze it. So we do need to have that balance against between the convenience of, of automation, the reduced error rate, the time saved and things like that. But also we still we need to make sure that we're still understanding the processes that we're carrying out and that the results are being checked properly, because often if you're copying and pasting, um, that's when the number that's wrong suddenly leaps out at you rather than um, when you're when you're actually checking it in many cases. So it's important to be able to make sure that we still have the relevant checks in, in place to make sure what we're doing is correct. So really automation's at its best when we come to routine and standardised tasks. Um, an example of that's shown on the right hand side where we have a number of standardised reports that are generated out of our coordinate measurement um, machine work. And one of the things that we've done is written a Python script that eliminates all of the copy pasting from the output of the machine into the report template. But the human still has to add the interpretation and what all of this means. So we're not taking the human out. We're not taking the checking out. We're just removing the possibility of error in the boring bit. Um, this is also really useful for metadata capture. So I mentioned that um, metadata is really about the background information and historically this would be noted in lab books and only referred to in extremis. It wouldn't necessarily be stored with the data, but we had a very large project at MPL where we were sharing a large amount of data externally, a large amount of complicated data externally. Um, so what we wanted to do was make sure that we could capture all of the metadata that was going to make the data that we shared informative to our project partners without inconveniencing the experimentalists any more than was necessary. And what we were able to do was to pull together um, information from the sample storage system, from the data itself, because again, the machine headers tend to have information with, um, stored with them. And then we have um, a customized web form that captures the details that only the experimentalists can apply can supply but this is kept to the absolute minimum that is necessary um, and furthermore the vocabulary is restricted and a certain amount of checking takes place as you put it in to ensure that we're getting the correct information and all of that captured metadata is then bundled with the data and stored in a large-scale database at MPL and one of the things that this offers us the opportunity to do is take all of that metadata, which is in machine readable form, and automatically generate something in human readable form that describes what the experiment was, what um, conditions it took place under, and so on. And you could imagine that you could supply this as supplementary information for your future publications. And because absolutely all of the metadata will be supplied with the description of the work itself, um, you're contributing towards an improvement of um, repeatability of science because you have supplied all of the information that should be necessary to repeat that to repeat that experiment. So really, it's helping with the reproducibility crisis. Um, Another aspect where we're doing a lot of work and we're expecting to see change fairly soon is in digital calibration certificates. So these exist to support traceability throughout a data processing chain or a supply chain where it is useful to have the calibration information traveling with um, the data as it gets processed, as it gets assessed, um, but in machine readable form rather than in human readable form. So they are more than just an electronic calibration certificate, so a PDF or something, they are actually machine actionable. They're not necessarily going to replace um, the paper version. The human readable version is still hugely important. We're not taking people out of the loop. But as I say, it means that the information can travel with the measured data. 
And this means that you can do things like automatically auditing supply chains. The work that's been done to date has largely been from a European funded um, project that's developed a framework for what these um, certificates might potentially look at look like rather and it's also produced an initial schema using xml that's one option for how we go about containing this information and it's looked at things like security safe sharing and things like that um, because obviously the the qualities those things are key to the quality system functioning correctly so we have to make sure that if we're going to um, augment what's already there it still meets the same set of criteria to ensure that we can trust what we're receiving um, this is just a very brief example showing how the traceability in the supply chain might work. Um, the important thing to note here, well, two important things really. The first is that the digitalization means that all of these checks that you can see here can be automated. They can be algorithmic rather than the assessor coming in and saying, OK, um, show me how your traceability chain back to national standards works. You'd just be able to run the algorithm that did it for you. Um, and the second thing to note is that we're going to have to be really careful. And there's some really interesting um, mathematical science around this, around sharing, because some of what may uh, be desirable to share from the manufacturer's point of view may not be desirable to share from the supplier's point of view. So it may be that the manufacturer doesn't actually get access to the calibration certificate, but there is an algorithmic check that checks that um, the contents of that certificate meet a certain a certain set of criteria without the data actually being exposed and there's all kinds of um, interesting questions around encryption and things like that that we're looking into at the moment for those um, in terms of what we're doing Again, this is international collaboration, but it's also national collaboration to make sure that the whole of the UK quality system is involved, um, but really one of the areas that we're focusing on is making sure that this is not disruptive for anybody. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to have to stop the methods that they're using to either generate certificates or to analyse the data on them. Um, we want people to be able to fit this stuff into their standard workflows, get the most out of it. So we're looking at things like Excel to XML because a lot of people use Excel to generate the kind of information that goes on to certificates. We want to make that possible, easy, trustworthy and reliable. Um, and another thing that we're doing um, that's ongoing at the moment that we're quite excited about is we're working on a case study with the National Composite Centre where we're going to be, we're hoping that we're going to be able to clearly demonstrate the benefit of having a digital certificate in addition to a paper one to, um, to show that the calibration information is available. In terms of digital delivery, um, this is about moving beyond paper reports to be able to supply data and analytics via the cloud, because there are lots of benefits to this that are listed just there. Um, the benefit to MPL is really that to some extent it enables us to hang on to the reference copy of either the data or the software. So it means that we're still retraining the ground truth. Um, and if people have problems with corruption of their data or malicious tampering, it, it's possible for us to say, no, we've got the original and this is that, um, and offer people access to data rather than them having the reference copy. Um, now, this is quite a wide variety of potential applications that we're talking about here. We do a huge variety of science at MPL and because of that there's a huge variety of things that we could potentially deliver digitally but they have common features so um, people will need user identifications verified to log in to access their data to make sure that one person can't access another person's data and things like that. There are common tools for visualisation and we're generally trying to provide a kind of common look and feel to these things so that people know that it's an MPL product. Um, and this means that there's lots of code use, um, lots of code reuse possible. And then in the longer term, um, we're kind of considering a developer portal so that if we have people that we trust developing applications that require access to MPL data, then we'd have a portal for them to be able to get at that and use it um, without actually having to take local copies. For instance, if it's data that gets updated on a regular basis, it may be that they want to pull a reliable time signal or something like that, and we may be able to offer them that kind of thing through this portal. 
Um, related to that, we've recently released for external testing our first digital product. So this is supplying data around advanced radiotherapy dosimetry audits, as you can see, in a form that the clinicians are able to interpret more easily, to interact with more easily. Um, we've had really positive feedback about this. Most of the questions that we've had are around aesthetics rather than functionality. And this is the whole process of developing this has kind of given us an insight into um, what questions we need to ask of our scientists when we're developing such products. And it's kind of speeding up the development of future products. So we've got a couple of other significantly different ones currently in development. Um, and we're hoping to be able to launch those over the coming year. And we've got lots and lots of ideas for other things we can deliver um, digitally, not least digital calibration certificates. So we're working on prioritisation at the moment. Now, I mentioned um, remote operation and in particular remote calibration earlier on. Um, we already have some colleagues who can monitor and control experiments from their sofas if they so choose. Um, and although that's comparatively rare, there are more instances where we think that equipment may be calibrated remotely potentially. There are various criteria that um, this kind of equipment would, or the calibration experiment would have to satisfy um, that are listed on that slide. But the big one's the benefit to the customer because we've tried this kind of thing before um, for calibration of particular electrical devices and we ended up dropping the service because there just wasn't the demand. But we think that um, some of the kit that exists now and didn't exist then is, is likely to create that demand rather more. And then for a bit of a future look, um, there's a lot of research at MPL at the moment on in situ realization of the base units that is likely to read is likely to lead to remote and automated um, monitoring by NMIs. So the realization of the unit will sit with the customer, but MPL can offer a service to make sure that um, the experiment is still working, basically. We're not expecting this to become universal, but it's it's one more option. And it's another example where uh, remote operation becomes important. So in terms of remote calibration, um, recently we've been looking at X-ray photon spectroscopy. And this is something where um, the real value during the calibration process is the analysis of the data. So we supply reference materials these are analysed within the lab instruments to create a spectrum, but then the um, capabilities and state of the machine itself are captured through the analysis of that spectrum. And historically, we've always supplied software on a CD. And this is problematic because if the standard that is used in the implementation of that software um, gets updated. Not only do we have to rewrite the software, we also have to send out 50 CDs and then support people when they can't install it and explain to them how to use it and so on and so forth. And it's all um, expensive and inconvenient and not always compatible with people's operating systems. Whereas if we switch to people uploading the Spectra to our digital services platform, the analysis takes place on MPL's side of the firewall, if you like. The results are then pushed back and we're able to issue a calibration certificate um, from that software directly. The user's happy because they've not had to mess around with the CD-ROM and we're happy because we're also able to offer um, additional performance indicators. So if we work with the same customers over time, then we can look at their instrument performance. We can issue them with reminders when calibrations become due. And it may be that you're able to um, calibrate your machine more frequently because the cost has dropped. You're not having to take it offline completely for such a long period. Um, so I want briefly to return to this slide because I'm going to talk about how the computation of aspect of this affects the data analytics that we do. Um, when we have that kind of network, the data is effectively passing through multiple computational devices and this asks this leads to some interesting questions around what we actually need from any given computation. So 
we're able to balance the energy usage, the cost, the accuracy, and so on. And it also means that we're revisiting old algorithms because lots of the devices that it's passing through may only have very limited memory and things like that. So it may be that we want to go back to algorithms for um, matrix inversion that are perhaps less stable under some circumstances, but can be better for limited memory term type applications. We still have a massive need for reliable algorithms to cover all of those different modalities and software quality systems so that we can definitely um, demonstrate that what we're doing is correct and it's what the user expects us to do. And finally, um, there are interesting questions around uncertainty propagation through the processing chain, particularly smart sensors um, end up adding uncertainties that are extremely difficult to quantify without extra knowledge. So data analytics then. What we're doing to, with that kind of system is gathering multi-scale, multimodal data about a single system. So we end up with very large amounts of very high dimensional data, but it's in an analyzable form because it's all digital. We can capture images that can be analyzed automatically. And again, this is something that's really changed um, within the last 10 to 20 years, I'd have said, image analysis and quantitative image analysis has become more of a possibility because of the cheapness of digital cameras, essentially. Um, and again, we can automate the collection and the linking. And what this leads us to is really three areas that, to my mind, are becoming more and more important. And I'll talk about each of those in a little bit more depth on the rest of my slides. Um, but from a metrology point of view, we still need to ensure that uncertainties can be associated with the results of all of those algorithms, because that's what really gives us the confidence in the number that we're using to make a decision. So if we start with data fusion, then um, we get asked big questions like how can we use measurement to understand battery degradation and improve battery lifetime? And different colleagues give us different answers. So the electrochemical group will say, well, the degradation is happening because of electrochemical reactions. So you need to measure the species concentrations. Um, the uh, dimensional people will say, well, it's the inner structure of the electrodes that's affecting those reactions. So you really need to understand the micro scale geometry before you can really understand what's going on with the degradation. Um, the electrical people say, well, what you actually care about within the battery is the current and the voltage. So obviously you need to be able to measure those. And then um, if we think about in operation, um, the reactions are typically causing physical changes. They might cause heating, they might cause swelling. So there are temperature and dimensional measurements that you can take that may be able to give you extra information. So what we have here is multimodal, it's multi-scale in terms of length scale. It's also multi-scale in terms of time scale because electrochemical reactions typically occur over a much, much shorter time scale than the actual battery lifetime that we're interested in. So what we really need to do is to be able to fuse all of those sources of data to produce information that we can then use to improve the battery lifetime. Now, this is kind of an umbrella term for a very wide range of activities, so it's quite difficult to provide guidance. Um, but the details are usually specified by the aim. Um, so you start from which question the data fusion is trying to answer. And usually we find that people gather data and then try to figure out what they can do with it rather than figure out what data they need to answer the question. So a lot of what we do is set up visualization tools so that people can pull together multi-source data. Um, the example you can see just there again is from battery lifetime assessment, but this really gives you insight into where there are correlations into what other information you might need and into what information you actually don't need. So what you usually get out of this first stage is a new question that you need to be answered or new data that you need to get. And then you can move to the second stage, which is rather more quantitative and potentially predictive. And this is where um, we end up bringing in physics based knowledge rather than just open ended exploration. And there are lots of challenges that are listed there. Um, in particular, the quality and consistency of data becomes very problematic. Um, and sometimes you have to look beyond just uncertainty evaluation as a measure of the quality of the data um, is something we're seeing increasingly, but this is an active area of work. I mentioned that imaging um, had made a really big difference over the last few years. Now, if I think about what an image actually is, 
it's something that the human visual system can process. And that's not a very helpful concept when you're moving to algorithmic processing of the images, really. So I think I would argue that an image actually refers to any sufficiently dense, for a given definition of sufficiently dense, spatially distributed measurement. Um, when we use digital cameras and the like, then we have a regular array of pixels, but point clouds can also be images as well. So the kind of black and white image you can see at the bottom left hand corner is actually a point cloud uh, gathered by LIDAR of a wheat field or part of a wheat field. And that's really processable as an image. Um, the measurements can vary hugely. And again, we're looking at data that's multi-scale, that's multimodal, and that could be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Now, um, typically people tend to process images qualitatively rather than quantitatively. But if we think about MRI scans um, that are able to give us information about blood flow within a particular organ, we may want to quantify how much blood flow there actually is within that organ. Similarly, if we have a thermal image, we might want to know what the temperature within a particular region is. And we talked to all of our colleagues that do different kinds of imaging, and we found that they had the same challenges of interest that are listed just there. Um, in particular, edge detection is one that we've been working on, and you can see an example of the work that's still at early stages on the right-hand side there. But really, um, we've found that there are lots of algorithms out there that carry out those tasks, but very few of them consider uncertainty. Um, they don't consider uncertainty at pixel level and how it's affected by the actual uh, physical approach of the imaging system itself. They may use signal to noise ratio as a kind of um, proxy almost for uncertainty, but that's about it. And there are very, very few that actually propagate this uncertainty through the algorithms or think about how um, you might go about that. So this is an area where we're really um, hoping to make a difference. Now, finally, I wanted to talk about machine learning a little bit. Um, again, this has been around conceptually for decades um, but it's really taking off now because digitalization has um, made capturing data, well, data sets of appropriate sizes, of appropriate complexity, and the ability to um, capture data that only a human would be able to um, analyze almost. So, again, we come back to images and things like that, where it requires a human to understand what it is that they're looking at. It can be very difficult, for instance, to describe something like a cat in rules that um, a computer would be able to understand. Whereas if you just show it enough pictures of cats in a machine learning algorithm, then it will develop an understanding of what a cat is after a fashion, or at least it will be able to say whether or not an image is a cat. Now, again, machine learning is a very broad term. There are lots of algorithms in common usage, but they do have some common factors. So what you typically have, um, what you can see on the screen is a very simple neural network, but most of the other types of algorithms similarly have a very complicated structure that's made up of lots and lots of very simple functions. And each of those simple functions potentially has a number of parameters associated with it and a weight. So you have a very large scale um, of parameters, number of parameters within this model. Typically, there's no link back to the problem at hand. So these functions might look like that kind of thing where you've got a nice smooth sigmoid that's varying between naught and one and the parameters would shift where it's zero is and potentially scale how rapidly that change occurs but what that isn't is physically meaningful i can't relate it to any property of the system that i'm interested in and that's kind of a problem in some ways um, and the big common factor is obviously that they use a very large amount of data um, for parameter estimation, um, which is called learning under these circumstances. In terms of what we're doing with this, then, we're focusing A, on measured data, which is what you'd expect from the National Physical Laboratory, but B, on trustworthy machine learning. And there are multiple facets to this, um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them in a little bit more detail on the remainder of my slides. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is that we are working with the Alan Turing Institute and the BSI on the AI Standards Hub. Um, so this has gone live and it's really a kind of um, gathering place, A, for the standards in AI that are being created, because at the moment there's lots of work in lots of different 
quite specialised committees going on that it will be useful to be able to pull together in one place so that people can see what's out there for individual applications. But also, um, as the hub develops, because it's only been launched comparatively recently, it's expected that it will provide more interaction with experts, more opportunities for training and things like that to really ensure that um, the standards get used so that we can have confidence in the results of AI algorithms. In terms of uncertainty, then, if we think about how um, the structure of these models might affect our usual process for evaluating measurement uncertainty, um, normally we would define a measurement model, we would assign uncertainties to the inputs or parameters of that model, and we would then propagate the uncertainty from those inputs to the outputs. Now, with machine learning algorithms, we've got a problem because we've got an absolutely huge number of parameters that are solely derived from data, which also has uncertainties associated with it. Um, and because we've got a huge number of parameters, we're usually determining these parameters or estimating them at any rate using stochastic methods. So that means that if I run the learning process twice, I'm not necessarily going to get the same parameter values out every time that I run it. So there's an uncertainty coming in there. Um, the model structure can have, a, have an effect. So what you can see there is a very simple neural network. Um, you can have more layers, you can have different interconnections and so on, and that's going to affect things. And also training data adequacy, and I'll show an example of that in a minute. And this is a very active area of research for us, because as I said, there are lots and lots of different types of algorithm, and each one requires a slightly different approach. So it means we'll, we'll be working on this for quite some time. Now, um, the example I have of machine learning um, in action, as it were, and is to do with inadequate alt text. So I asked my colleague Jenny to send me a picture of herself um, for another talk that I was giving, and she sent me this. And PowerPoint suggested to me that the alt text for this should be a picture containing person, hair. And that's basically because machine learning algorithms only know what you show them. They cannot extrapolate. They can only ever interpolate. So if I've not shown the algorithm enough goats, it doesn't know that one of the things in that picture that's important is a goat. Now, that's quite trivial, but when we move to things like facial recognition algorithms, then we need to be able to show the algorithm everything that it might see um, so that you don't end up discriminating against people. And you can imagine that for scientific applications or for medical applications, you've got the same kind of problem. You need to be able to show that algorithm everything that it might see in practice. So we've been trying to help people um, get to the point where they know what kind of requirements that actually imposes on the data sets that they need. Um, we've produced a good practice report on training set preparation. So that's effectively the data that you use to carry out the learning for marine navigation systems. Now that sounds extremely specific, but it has um, a number of points in there that are relevant to anybody who's attempting to change attempting to train an algorithm for object identification from images, no matter what the application is. So it works for cars, it potentially works for aircraft and so on. And there are lots of other examples where this type of guidance is going to be useful for people. Um, we've looked at robustness of one particular type of algorithm to noise. Now, the reason this is useful is it um, if we have an algorithm that we train on high quality data that has low noise, and then we attempt to use that algorithm to um, analyze data that is noisy, then we need to know that the results from the noisy data are still going to be reliable. And we found that they aren't, surprisingly enough. Um, so this means either we can produce guidance on when algorithms are or are not suitable for use, or we can produce minimum standards for data quality in order for a particular algorithm to be able to analyze that data reliably. So all of this, again, is giving us confidence in the outputs of the machine learning algorithms. We are currently doing some very exciting work um, on a fundamental metrology application, um, which is to do with plateau detection um, for self-validating thermocouples um, in particular, we're looking at being able to associate a numerical uncertainty with that plateau detection. Um, I can't really talk about that in detail, but i um, very excited indeed about that work because it's really ensuring that we can use these algorithms in a metrology setting reliably. 
And then finally, um, one that I've kind of skimmed over is explainability. So I mentioned earlier that these algorithms can tell you about correlations, um, but they don't really explain why the decision that they've made, the classification that they've made um, takes place. So what you can see on the right hand side is the outputs of some work that we've done with the Ordnance Survey, where they're using um, machine learning algorithms to be able to classify land usage. So is it a field? Is it a road? Is it some water or what? And the two kind of weird looking algorithms you've got on the right hand side are two approaches to determining which bit of that image most contributed to the classification that was made. Um, um, we're interested in what does and doesn't work for those algorithms. So it turns out that the presence of cloud is a big problem. It turns out that if you gather data after it's rained, then it may end up um, misclassifying data, not just thinking that it's water, but other forms of misclassification as well. So you've just had a whistle stop tour through what MPL is doing, um, A, to collect digital data, B, to ensure that we can have confidence in the decisions we make using that data. And I wanted to close by emphasising that this is evolution, not revolution. Lots of you are probably already doing this, but the point is it really is becoming a lot more widespread. There are lots of opportunities for automation, remote interaction, advanced analytics and innovative visualisation that will help us to make better use of the data that we're gathering and better use of the time that we spend gathering and analysing that data. Um, the fact that we're able to gather multimodal, multi-scale, multi-dimensional data means that we can start to answer questions about complex systems. I already mentioned climate change. I already mentioned antimicrobials. Um, there are lots of examples where we have a complex system that we need to understand in more depth and being able to gather large amounts of data about that is really going to help us um, answer the challenges that we're facing. But in order to have the confidence that we need, we're still going to need traceability. We're still going to need uncertainty evaluation so that we can be confident that the data we've got is reliable and we're making decisions based on a good understanding of how much we can trust the number we've got out at the end. Thank you for your attention. And I'd also like to thank all of those people for giving me the exciting range of images you've just seen.